Good evening and welcome to this public lecture hosted by Cambridge House Christian Study Center. My name is John Thompson and I'm the director of uh, the center. Uh, whether this is your first time uh, at one of our events or you've been to all of our events since we've opened our doors, that's basically possible because we're, we're pretty new. Uh, whichever of those, wherever you fall in that spectrum, we are very glad you're here. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, I have the privilege of introducing our esteemed guest speaker tonight in a moment, but first I wanted to tell you, in case you are new to Cambridge House, just a little bit about us and what we do. We're a study center located at 930 Jamestown Road. We're just uh, down the road from the university. And we're open actually three days a week, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. We have a, a study space that you can use. We always offer coffee and food, and uh, engaging conversations are usually part of the day. So I hope you'll join us. Cambridge House, though, despite its name, is more than a place. It's also a community. It's an intellectual community aimed at asking the great questions that have always animated the life of the university. What is truth, and how do we attain it? Is there a God, and can he be known? What do we do about historical and present injustices? And crucially, what is a human person? Or as the author, one of my favorites, Wendell Berry, asks the question, what are people for? It is this final question that is the topic, both of our lecture tonight and the lecture series that we're launching this evening. Our lecture series is called Human Nature and Humanistic Endeavor. So together, we hope, with the whole university, to raise the question of the relationship between anthropology on the one hand and the humanities on the other. After all, the humanities arguably have been at the core of the life of William and Mary for the last 331 years. And I would submit we cannot understand the point and purpose of the humanities without understanding and debating the point and the purpose of human beings. In short, what are we all doing here at this institution? The next lecture uh, in this series will take place on the 12th of April, and we'll, be ha we'll have a visit from uh, the University of Cambridge uh, Professor of Philosophy of Religion, Douglas Headley. So you'll hear more about that in the coming weeks. And as we launch into this uh, series, I just want to take a moment, though, and thank all of those who've made it possible. First of all, our co-sponsors, um, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, Reform University Fellowship, and the Catholic Campus Ministry. Thank you all for supporting us. And I also wanted to say a thank you to um, the Center for Religion, Culture, and Democracy, which has uh, provided some funding for this lecture series. I can think of no better way to start uh, this series than with our speaker this evening. Dr. Angel Adams Parham is Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Virginia, and she's a senior fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture in Charlottesville. Dr. Par Parham's published scholarly work includes the much celebrated monograph, American Roots, Racial Palimpsests and the Transformation of Race by Oxford University Press in 2017. And she also uh, published a book in 2022 that I commend to you called The Black Intellectual Tradition, Reading Freedom in Classical Literature. Finally, Dr. Parham is involved not only in scholarship, but is also co-founder of a nonprofit, uh, Nyansa Classical Community. Nyansa provides classical Christian curriculum programming designed to connect with and draw students from diverse backgrounds into the beauty of classical literature and the great conversation. So Dr. Parham, we're so happy to have you with us. She'll be speaking on personalism, and the black intellectual tradition for about 50 minutes, and we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Parham. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson, and thank you to Cambridge House and to all of the sponsors of this event. It is an absolute pleasure and honor to be here, to be part of this series, and I'm really looking forward to being in conversation with you. Um, so I may be the first to speak, but I do hope that we can have a conversation, absolutely. 
So yes, I will be speaking with you on this idea of personalism and the black intellectual tradition. So I want to think about where are we right now? Right? It's been kind of crazy times, I think, in, in this country. Um, so what is the problem? And I'd say there are a few things um, that we lack a shared vision of the good life. We lack a shared vision of the good society. And we have a very pluralist society that rejects a faith-based version of this. And the church itself is increasingly at odds with itself about what the good life and the good society actually are. So when we think about this last issue of, as a church, who are we? What are we thinking? Um, I think these are some of the kinds of questions that are running through our minds. So where are we today overall? How should Christians relate to the larger culture and its culture wars? Are we losing political and cultural influence for good? Is this kind of the, the last aspect of um, the church having any kind of real influence over American society? And how do we be the church moving forward in this very transitional time? So I think there have been a number of responses to this, right? And so I'm gonna rehearse some of them for you. Some of you may be very familiar with them. Some of you may be less familiar with them. So bear with me. Um, so one way um, is Rod Dreher's Benedict Option, which has been very much in conversation in um, church circles, right? And so what I've excerpted here is what um, Dreher sees as being kind of a central tension that the church is dealing with. Hostile secular nihilism has won the day in our nation's government, and the culture has turned powerfully against traditional Christians. We tell ourselves that these developments have been imposed by a liberal elite because we find the truth intolerable. The American people either actively or passively approve. Right, so we look out at the landscape and we see you know, that things are not as we would have expected them to be even a generation ago. Right, that we do not have broad-based agreement on many very basic cultural issues that we would have thought would have been unquestionable. Right? Um, and so the Benedict Option, you know, and, and I, I'm very well aware there have been, um, you know, kind of a lot of back and forth about exactly what the Benedict Option is, you know, what is it saying, um, with some saying that it seems to be calling us to kind of retreat from society and, you know, kind of really dig in, in, in to ourselves and Christian culture. Um, with others saying, well, it's not, you know, kind of an absolute retreat. Um, that's not exactly what it is. But there definitely is this sense that there's this very hostile larger culture that we need to be very careful about, that we need to kind of, um, especially for our young people, be very careful about how we cultivate those young people in these very hostile waters that we are within. And so the Benedict Option has been one of those answers that is on the table for what we do and where we are right now um, as Christians in America. So another approach has been what some call the Augustinian option rather than a Benedict option. And so Augustine, of course, is writing um, at the crumbling of the Roman Empire and is really wrestling with what does it mean to be a Christian, what does it mean to be the church within this larger looming empire, right? And so some have said this is really you know, the way that we might want to think about it. Um, James K. Smith um, takes this on directly in his review of the Benedict Option. And so he is one who has interpreted the Benedict Option as being this idea of kind of retreating and digging down into Christian culture and not engaging the larger culture as much. And so the Augustinian option that he proposes, um, he says, my hope is that instead we'll answer an Augustinian call centering ourselves in the life-giving practices of the body of Christ, so that is that we are going to look inside, we are going to focus on cultivating Christian culture, but from there, leaning out boldly and hopefully into the world for the sake of our neighbors. It is this kind of Augustinian call that Martin Luther King Jr. answered in the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and so those of you who are familiar with James K. Smith will know that he talks a lot about the idea of cultural litur um, liturgies, right? And the idea that he um, thinks that perhaps we have become very assimilated into the larger American culture to the point where it's hard to tell apart often um, the believers from everyone else in our larger culture. And so when he focuses on these cultural liturgies, he's saying 
be aware of just assuming that things that seem culturally neutral are not shaping you and perhaps deforming you. Um, and so that's one of the, the, you know, kind of the larger concepts that he thinks about. He wants us to really think through what are the larger cultural liturgies that we're getting sucked into and how do we perhaps build on some of those deeper um, cultural resources of the church, even going back to antiquity, to refresh those cultural litur um, liturgies and to really exist within what is a larger culture that is not overwhelmingly Christian at this point. So we've got these two um, responses, the Benedict option, the Augustinian option. And then increasingly, there is another option, um, which has been dubbed the Christian nationalist response. I think those within the movement would not call themselves Christian nationalists necessarily. Um, but this is an idea where you have really have this merging um, of the larger national project and the Christian project. Um, which you see kind of exemplified here in the flags, right? Um, around January 6th, but it's not only around January 6th, there's kind of a larger idea of what it means to be a Christian at this point in time and what we need to do in order to speak to the culture and resist the direction that the culture is going. Um, so those are just three options. I'm not saying those are the only three options, but these are some of the responses that have come um, to bear on these larger questions about where are we as a church? How do we be the church? You know, what are the things that we are up against? Um, is it really, in fact, the case that um, a Christian culture has pretty much receded and gone away from the center of American culture? So what I want to bring to you today is another response, another um, possible response that we might have, another tradition of cultural resources to draw on, and that is the black church tradition. And so what you have here in this drawing, it's a, a wood engraving actually from the 19th century, it's a hush harbor. So a place where the enslaved could escape to to have their own um, religious services away from the prying eyes of the white majority. Right. And so what you're seeing here is an expression of Christianity radically on the margins. And so what I want to propose to you is that this is a very, very good model for us today in the midst of whatever, which of those um, responses you take, I think there's large agreement across them that Christian understandings of the world, traditional Christian understandings of the world are being pushed more and more to the margins of our society, right? The way we respond to that can differ quite a bit, but there's general agreement that, you know, we are not seeing kind of the core of, of, of basic Christian understandings. Um, and I, what I want to say here too is that I'm not saying so much that, oh, you know, we don't have as many Christians. I'm saying that even when, if we were looking at a generation ago, even if people weren't overtly religious, there were many cultural convictions that stood on long-term cultural um, Christian foundations. And those foundations are being more and more questioned every day. Um, and so that's what I mean. And so what I think is a really important gift of the black church is that the black church has come from the margins, is used to being on the margins, right? Um, and so it's not new to be on the margins. And yet, to have a, this tradition of being able to flourish and exist in powerful ways from those margins to speak to the larger society. So it's not like the black church has been on the margins and has just fizzled out or has had no impact or has had no power. None of that is true. Um, so what this tradition does is it models for us a way of being the church when you, the wind is not at your back culturally, you know, when you are being harassed, right? Um, so I think this is a very important model to look at. And you also see in the black church a tradition of walking together with those who are suffering, with those who are being oppressed and harassed. And then finally, the final point I think is extremely important, that what you also have in the black church is an ability to focus relentlessly on justice, on calling out inequality, on calling out what is wrong, but blending that together with grace and mercy for those who are oppressing. 
And I think that is an extremely important point because it's so easy when one feels like you're being pressed up against the wall, when you're being attacked, when you're being pushed to the margins, to lash out um, and to kind of paint people who are in a different position to you or maybe who are actually literally oppressing you um, as the big bad other that is just evil that we must conquer. Right? And what I'm saying is that in the black church tradition, there is a very long-term model of how to come up against injustice, how to stand for what is right without seeking to do the same thing to your oppressors that they did to you. Right? And so I think this is another very important aspect of the black church that is a model for what do we do you know, when we find ourselves in a larger environment that feels very hostile to the core of what we believe. So to come back to those problems that I outlined on the left, I want to then propose um, some, a, a potential response on the right. So that Christians can model a life-giving vision that draws others to truth, goodness, and beauty. I do believe that our society is very hungry for that for truth, for goodness, for beauty, for something larger to give ourselves to other than petty and fighting and grabs for power. But in order to do that, we must truly believe that there is strength even in our weakness and that that happens as we rely on God. Right? And then finally, the black church and the black intellectual tradition provide these models for holding um, what can feel like opposing tensions together in a kind of fruitful tension that helps us to understand how do we move forward when it seems like one thing is against us, another thing could be for us. How do we hold things together in tension and move forward fruitfully? So with that, I want to um, start out by talking about Martin Luther King Jr. and what in his um, personalist faith helps to kind of bring out some of the central aspects of the black church that would be helpful um, as a model. So just a little bit of background on him. So he came from um, a really loving, wonderful, very upper middle class home, um, very well educated, mother and father well educated, father was a, pa a pastor, a Baptist pastor as well. And so he had modeled for him really the best of the black church tradition. His father was also very focused on the issue of justice um, and looking at the suffering of his people and working for the good of the black community. And so King really grows up and is nurtured in a family that is looking out at the landscape of Jim Crow, is looking out at a landscape of violence, um, both symbolic as well as literal, and that is using and understanding the church to be the community that is going to speak for and to and within the lives of those who are suffering on the margins. He goes off to college at Morehouse College at a very young age, he's only 15, and he majors in my discipline, sociology. And I have to think that that's probably because sociologists have been very concerned with those on the margins, with, with social problems and inequalities and so on. And so from a very young age, he is looking for tools to help him to help his community. He then goes on to seminary. And um, this is taken from the autobiography of Martin Luther King Jr. He did not actually write an autobiography, um, but this scholar, um, Carson, has really kind of put together very nicely documents and letters and speeches from his life that give you kind of the full scope of his life over time. And so this aspect of his time at seminary, I think, really also gives us an insight into what King was wrestling with and the problem that he's trying to solve very practically. The minister must somehow take profound theological and philosophical views and place them in a concrete framework. I must forever make the concrete simple. I see the preaching ministry as a dual process. On the one hand, I must attempt to change the soul of individuals so that their societies may be changed. On the other, I must attempt to change the societies so that the individual soul will have a change. Therefore, I must be concerned about unemployment, slums, and economic insecurity. And so what you see there is, uh, you know, how do I have the integrity both theologically and socially, speaking into the lives of real people who are dealing with real problems? This is not a faith that is just an otherworldly faith. So we're not just kind of, you know, in um, a, a raft trying to pull people out and save them, and, and then that's it. 
right? How are they going to pay their bills? What are they going to do the next time they're stopped by the police who want to brutalize them? Like, these are the real things that they have to deal with, and you need to deal both with the spiritual and with the social aspect at the same time. These are not contradictory things. So to get to this idea of personalism, so there are some key tenets that we can take away from this idea of personalism. The first is that God is personal and loving. He's not just hovering up there, you know, kind of abstractly, but right, God has a very personal um, desire to know you personally, who you are um, in the intimacies of your everyday life and your problems as well as your joys. The inherent dignity of persons, and this is really very key, the inherent dignity of persons as such or in themselves, it doesn't matter how lowly that person is or how high up that person is. And of course, this is something, you know, when he is working in the heart of Jim Crow, that is not an assumption that everyone has, right? That there is inherent dignity. You know, he talks about the way that black Americans would be reduced to being called boy or girl when they were my age. Right? Um, so this sense of you know, this priceless human dignity in every person. The importance of the personal communal spirit. And so this is the idea that we are not just a society of individuals, but that the community is a crucial part of what it means to be human. And so we have to think about these two in dialogue. It's not just I'm gonna go off and make my individual way. It is what is the larger community that sustains me, that I contribute to, that I draw from. And so the personal and the communal working together, very important. And then finally, the need to protest injustice and social evil, to call that out, to be clear about it, and to ever be working toward the coming of the beloved community. So these are four tenets that really underlie everything um, that King was trying to do in the community. And this gives us three guiding questions, and these questions kind of help us to think about, so how do you live out this kind of personalist faith? So first, what does the dignity or sacredness of persons mean in the most concrete sense of day-to-day -day living for the marginalized, for the disinherited? What does the conviction that God is personal mean concretely for those victimized by racism as well as those who benefit from it? And both of those are important, right? It's not just those who are victimized, but those who are engaging in the victimizing also are spiritually hungry, right? And so both of those you have to deal with. And then what will such personalistic convictions look like once they've been applied to the struggle for freedom and justice? And I'll be talking about these more as I go along. So I want to draw from Letter from a Birmingham Jail to kind of think through these questions of the concrete. You know, like, how do you respond? How do you think? Um, and what I want us to be thinking about as I'm going through these different passages is to think about um, our latest wave of uprisings and protests starting in 2020, right? Um, and so with the killing of George Floyd, um, having many people being very, very upset in the streets protesting, um, and initially, you had many Americans of all colors who were very behind it, and then we've had this backlash, right? We've had this great backlash. We've had this issue of, you know, well, is this really just a lot of CRT and wokeness? You know, what's going on here, right? And so as you're thinking about this, so the context that he is talking about is, is quite different from what we're dealing with today. So I'm not saying it's the same thing, but I do want us to be thinking about what is it that the protesters had their finger on? Were there some issues there that did need to be visited? Um, because while the, the approaches or the tactics may be questionable sometimes, the core issues, it doesn't mean those core issues are not issues that need to be considered, right? So, so King is starting out by saying, I guess it's easy. You know, if you have never felt this, it's easy for you to think, well, you should be able to wait, right? But he says, but when you've seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, brutalize, and even kill your black brothers and sisters with impunity, it's gonna be really hard for you to wait, right? And that's, this is similar to what the protesters were saying. It's like, this is not something that we're gonna stand for um, anymore. When you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, it's hard to say 
wait. All right? Um, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see the tears welling up in her little eyes when she is told that Fun Town is closed to colored children and see the depressing clouds of inferiority begin to form in her little mental sky and see her begin to distort her little personality by unconsciously developing a bitterness toward white people it is hard to wait. Now, this one, um, certainly we don't have legalized racial segregation anymore. But I just want to interject here because sometimes it can feel like, well, this is all, you know, old history. Like, none of this is here anymore. But what I would say, um, raising black children, raising black daughters, is that no, thankfully we are not at this point, you know, where my daughters couldn't go to the equivalent of Fun Town. They can go, and I'm very happy for that. Um, but there are other issues that come up. Right? Um, so how is it when your young daughter comes home and basically says she wishes she had white skin? You know, that why doesn't she have white skin? Why can't she have the same hair that the white girls have? You know, this is not good skin. This is not good hair. I don't want to look this way. And having to kind of talk them out of that and show them examples of why you are beautiful, right? Um, even though you have a whole culture that seems to be allied against that idea. Uh, there are other issues. Um, this comes down to the naming of my daughters. So I had in mind um, some beautiful African names that I wanted to give them, Nia and Imani. They are not named Nia and Imani because I know the sociological research on that is still separating us, unfortunately. Um, too many studies where the researcher will send out the same resume with the same qualifications, but with different names. Um, so there is literally an article called, Are Emily and Greg More Employable Than Lakeisha and Jamal? Go and Google it. And you will find that indeed, Emily and Greg are more employable than Lakeisha and Jamal, even if you have the same resume the name gets you more or less calls. It's another one called The Mark of a Criminal Record by Diva Pager, where she did a similar thing, but her twist was, I'm gonna send out these resumes, um, and some of these people are going to be black, some of them are going to be white, um, some of them will have a criminal record, and some of them won't have a criminal record. And she found that white men with a criminal record got more callbacks than um, black men without a criminal record, which is very concerning to say the least. Is there something I need to do? Okay. Um, so those are some of the ways that we see concerns today. Thankfully not the same concerns that we had during King's time, but concerns nonetheless. Um, and I guess while John is working on that, I will try to memorize what the rest of my slides are. Um, but basically, I know there were other um, selections that I had from Letter from a Birmingham Jail that, you know, again, kind of get at this issue of what you say we should wait, but this is what we're dealing with. This is the reality of what we are dealing with right now. So I know one of the next things that I wanted to talk to you about, apart from Letter from a Birmingham Jail, is the way that he engaged in what he called dialectical reading. And so this is a way, so when he was in seminar and when he was in graduate school, he was really searching these books. He was really reading deeply in philosophy and theology and sociology. He's trying to understand, you know, what do I do to help my people? And so one of the key things that he would do is he read everything. But he was very careful about how he took lessons away from what he read. So the example that I give on these lovely slides that we'll be working any second is his reading of Marx, right? Um, and as I say this, I want you to think about all that we have been going through with the idea of critical race theory, for example, which has been quite the boogeyman um, of late. So what he says about Marx is, you know, yeah, I can't really embrace their anti-religion, you know, that's not something that I am willing, that's not gonna work for me as a Christian, right? Um, I can't embrace the idea of the state owning everything. You know, that is not something that I can work with. But he says, what I can do is I can see 
<laughs> I can see that, um, that Marx has a point that there's a problem when we so prioritize making money and the profit motive over everything else, to the point that we are so focused on making a living and not making a life. Look at that, I even remembered it. Um, so we're so focused on making a living and not making a life, right? Um, and so what you see him doing in this dialectical reading is he's saying, I, you know, I can read everything, right? That doesn't mean I have to take everything. Um, I am going to be discerning, spiritually discerning, right? Discerning using my reason. And this is what I suggest we need to do with things like critical race theory, right? So I am a sociologist. I have taught critical race theory for many years before it became a cultural boogeyman. Right? And so it's been really astonishing to stand aside and see that CRT is bringing down the entire American Republic now. Um, and then many things that are called CRT are actually not CRT, but that's another whole discussion. But let's take the actual CRT. There is no reason not to read it. Right? That doesn't mean that you're going to accept it whole hog. Right? You shouldn't accept anything whole hog like that. Right? You read it, you see what is there here that I can get out of it, and then you move on to the next thing. Right? Um, and so I think King is also a really good model for that, rather than kind of getting into these trenches and saying, you know, we can't do that, this is bad. What is there as a believer? Um, believers should know that they have, hopefully, the spiritual maturity to be able to discern what is good and what is not. Um, then also there's this sense of grace and mercy toward oppressors. And these are some of my favorites here. And so what he's saying is like, you know, we boycott, not just to boycott, but because we want to create the beloved community, and importantly, we want to turn opposers into friends. We're not just out to seize power and put them down. We want to make those opposers friends. That's a very different posture from we are going to seize control and do things our way and cast those other people to the side. And then also similarly, what he's saying here is that love is everything, which it should be for a Christian, right? And so you are called to love those who despise us. And in the end, what we want is redeeming goodwill for all people, not for people like us, not for people who believe the way we do, for all people. And that's a much larger project. And then finally, you have to do this incarnationally. You've got to be in relationship with people in order to do this. It's not something you can do from afar. You have to be in the trenches, in people's lives, and engaged with them personally in order to do this kind of work. So what I want to do now um, is I want to kind of put this to the test. You know, how, how does this kind of faith, this kind of personalist faith, and the example of the black church, what does that look like? when it is um, acting as a model for people who don't come from that tradition. And so I'm going to talk about Bonhoeffer and lessons from the black church. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Bonhoeffer. Um, it was news to me that he was so impacted by the black church. Um, it's not something that I have just known for very long. So a little background. He's born in 1906, comes from a large family. And his faith, this point is very important. He grew up in a highly intellectual family. They really weren't in the habit of going to church. They mainly stayed at home and sang hymns and read scripture, but it was very, very intellectual. So not a personalist idea at all, if you think about those points that I outlined. But he knew that he wanted to study theology from an early age. So the Bonhoeffer family and all of Germany were devastated by World War I. And here you get a sense of the personal devastation in his family alone. Um, death was stalking every door. Germany felt humiliated. It was a horrifying time. You're losing your family and you feel nationally humiliated, right? And so what this led to was this kind of um, reorientation of faith as something where what Bonhoeffer is getting at is this idea that we have to see how we can assert ourselves and that you're gonna give a, a kind of Christian justification for asserting ourselves as the German people. So these first two excerpts are from before Bonhoeffer was impacted by the black church. 
all right? And he's kind of giving this justification for this very muscular German nationalist understanding of the faith. So Volker, and Volker has to do with, it's just the people, you know, a, a certain people group. Volker are like individuals. At first, they are immature and need guidance. Then they grow into the blossom of youth, mature into adults, and they die. Growth requires expansion, and increase in strength involves pushing aside other individuals. Should not a Volk experiencing God's call on its own life and its own youth and in its own strength be allowed to follow that call, even if it disregards the lives of other people? God is the Lord of history. So it's giving this very muscular justification for German nationalist Christian faith. And then he goes on and he says, I know that the scripture says you have to love your enemies, but let's think this through. You have to think it through in context, is basically what he's saying. It would be an utter perversion to love my enemy and precisely in doing so to surrender my neighbor to destruction. It's simply not possible to love or to protect both my enemy and my people. And then he says, my people have given me everything. They have given me who I am. And so I have to be first wedded to the good of my people over those who are my enemy, right? But then he starts to ask some questions. Um, he starts to think about, you know, really what is the essence of this faith? What does it mean to live out the gospel of Jesus? He had a post in Barcelona where he started to question some things and to think about things. And he starts to think, I don't know if academia is where I'm going to stay. I'm not sure it's giving me satisfying answers. And then later on in his life, he reflects on this time in his life. He says, I don't even think I was really a Christian at that point. I think I was kind of using the faith to justify what I thought was good for me. So he then spends a year in New York City at Union Theological Seminary, and he starts going to churches, and he's studying theology, and he's saying, you know, this is not really doing it for me. This is, what are they talking about, you know? Um, and he's particularly frustrated by white churches and what he's finding preached in those churches. And so here's his analysis. He says, because the spirit of God is in a profound sense not conceived as being tied to the word, they do not understand what sermon, confession, dogma, church, and community are. And so he's saying the church really isn't a place. And he's speaking specifically about the white liberal churches that he's seeing. This is not a place that's really laying a claim on people's lives. And so in place of the church being a place of believers in Christ, it's really more of a, a, a social corporation or a charitable entity rather than really being the people of God. He also has a word for white fundamentalist churches. Here, a different side of the American character manifests itself, namely an unrelenting harshness in holding onto one's possessions, possessions either of this or the other world. I acquired this possession with trust in God. God made my success happen. So whoever infringes upon this possession is infringing upon God. It's obvious that no understanding for the vitality of the church can emerge on such a basis. You know, so he's getting at this idea of materialism, right? Um, which we do very well in the United States, indeed. Okay, so then he starts to go to some black churches and he's seeing a very different incarnation of the gospel there. So he says, when we're trying to assess this, this bad situation of the church, well, we have to draw attention to one church group um, where most of what I've been saying does not actually apply. And, and this is the Negro church. So during my overall stay in America, I spent a great deal of time getting to know the Negro problem from every angle and also observing white America from this rather hidden perspective. So this is an example of where going to the margins, you see things you can't see at the center of power. And that's what he was able to do when he was part of the black church. And he gets to the sermon. So he's listening really carefully to these sermons. He says, I've heard only one sermon. So this is at the beginning of him going to black churches. He's writing a letter. I've heard only one sermon so far in which you could hear something like a genuine proclamation and that was delivered by a Negro. Indeed, in general, I'm increasingly discovering greater religious power and originality in the Negroes. And then next, here in the Negro church, one really could still hear someone talk in a Christian sense about sin 
and grace and the love of God and ultimate hope, anyone who has heard and understood the Negro spirituals knows about the strange mixture of reserved melancholy and eruptive joy in the soul of the Negro. And so we're getting here um, closer and closer to this personalist vision that we laid out in the beginning with MLK. We're getting closer and closer to this sense of concrete personal um, relations and knowing intimately the suffering of others is what he's starting to really get at. So he actually um, spends a lot of time at Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem. And he is really in there. He's teaching Sunday school. He's helping to lead a women's um, Bible study. He is doing this weekly day church school. He's going to people's homes. You know, he has very close black friends. So this is not just like he's dabbling and going to a couple of services here and there. He's really immersing himself in the community and in the lives of the people and really getting to know their suffering and their struggles. And he's very excited. He says, this is a group of people really relying on God. These are people who are giving their all to following Christ. This is what I've been looking for. This is the vitality that I've been looking for. Um, and when he does go back to Germany, it is with this kind of bolstered understanding and courage to go up against the powers that be in the rise of Nazi Germany. So this is a, a quote by Reggie Williams, who wrote Bonhoeffer's Black Jesus, um, which is a book I commend to you, which goes into deeper detail. And so this is Dr. Williams' um, assessment of what this time did for Bonhoeffer. The transformation that was inspired by his incarnational experience in the Church of the Outcast of America became the lens through which the Sermon on the Mount was seen, mobilizing it as commandments to obey from within the context of solidarity and suffering. Suffering and obedience carried new weight for Bonhoeffer from within his rather hidden perspective of solidarity with the blacks who knew Jesus as one of the oppressed. And sadly, he was unfortunately to become one of the oppressed, um, him together with this confessing church in Germany that did absolutely outstanding work underground. So I want to move us now. So we've looked at um, King's personalist vision. We've looked at an example of this leading intellectual theological light, Bonhoeffer, and what it did for him to see this model of the black church um, and move him away from a very kind of muscular nationalist faith towards something that was really oriented toward the suffering Christ and suffering um, in the world, calling out injustice as you're getting to know real people and helping them in their suffering. So I want to think about where does that leave us for today? And before I make that transition, though, I do want to acknowledge that both of these were flawed men, right? We know about King, um, his infidelity. Um, you know, Bonhoeffer, he died being accused of, of plotting the, the um, assassination of Hitler, you know, which isn't necessarily the case. There's some debate on that. Um, but what I want to say is that I think we can do what King did and to look at what can we take from their lives, right? There are the areas where they were weak and where they were sinners, but there are, there's a great testimony there as well that we can take from their lives. And so I wanna do now, um, as I move toward the end, is think about how do we move from a kind of intellectual knowledge that people are suffering and that you know, things are unjust in the world to one that really allows us to connect with those who are suffering, that moves us from the intellectual to the personal and to more of a personalist understanding. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna um, tell you a little bit about how this has applied for me. So I have studied sociology for, oh goodness, about 30 years now, it's been a long time. And so I settled on that as a college major. I was drawn to it because I always had this sense, I think that we could be a better society. Have heart for those who are oppressed, for those who are on the margins, and wanna think about how do we make things better for those people, right? So I have been studying this for a very long time, but it wasn't really until I moved into a low-income, largely African-American neighborhood in New Orleans that I started to really see things in a very different way. 
that is really in line with this personalist tradition that King is trying to call us to. Now, some people may be surprised and think, well, you're African American, surely you've already known all of this. Um, but there are very different kinds of African American people. I did not grow up in the inner city. I did not grow up in the circumstances of the people that I would now be immersed in in Central City, New Orleans. That was not my reality, right? I've had a lot of very good opportunities, excellent education, access to many resources, to travel the world. Um, this community in Central City, New Orleans, people have not had those experiences for the most part. So this, um, this is the area of the neighborhood. We still have the house there in New Orleans. And so what happened is post-Katrina, um, the city was trying to figure out how to rebuild. And they had a number of vacant lots in this neighborhood. And our church was one that was known for working on issues of justice and for trying to be a presence in the community. And so the city gave several plots of land to our church. We had just recently joined this church. We joined it post-Katrina. We were there before Katrina, but we joined it post-Katrina. And so the, the pastor drives us around this neighborhood, which is kind of desolate looking, honestly, and says, this is where your house is gonna be. I can see you living here. And I'm thinking, uh, I don't know if I can see me living here. Like, this is not looking real exciting to me. Um, again, I did not grow up in this situation, right? Um, I said, let us pray. Let us pray. <laughs> Very pious. Um, so we prayed on it. I prayed on it. I had my quiet times. I asked God. Okay, I guess we're moving forward with this thing. Okay, okay. okay I guess God is going to be with us. So we build the house. It was a vacant lot. We build the house. We move in. Now, mind you, areas known for drug dealing on the very corner that we're moving into. That was the hot corner. Um, so we have a three-year-old and a baby. And we are just moving into this house. Um, at the time, across the street from us, there were some somewhat questionable characters. There was one man who had a rather red face and seemed to be very fond of the drink. Um, and then there were various comings and goings from houses right across from us that didn't look like dinner parties. We'll just put it that way. Um, so I'm looking at all of this and you know, kind of just trying to raise my children, but also trying to get to know my neighbors and kind of working with the church you know, at the same time. So this is where I start to really see what I've been reading in these sociology texts all of these years, right? But it didn't touch me the way it did when I was living in the house, right? Across from the people who were in the studies that I was reading about. And I think this is part of that, those four principles of kind of concretely, what does this mean? Who are these people that you are now going to get to know, not as a project, not as an intellectual idea, not as a research study, but your good is wrapped up with their good. You know, God help us, we really need to do something about this drug dealing. You know, my neighbors who are hurting, what can we do? What can we do to turn this around? How can I pray with? How can I befriend and get to know people in this neighborhood? And so here are a few more photos. These are recent photos. Um, so this, this is not immediately post-Katrina. This is pretty much what it looks like right now. And so you will see things like the tires abandoned, you know, various kinds of junk on the side of the road. Um, and so it can be, you know, a little bit of hard going. Um, in our time there, we lived there, before we moved to Virginia, we had lived there for about 10 years. All right, so my girls grew up there. That is where the majority of their growing up happened. Um, in this neighborhood. And so there were um, too many days when the gunshots would start and we would run up to the third floor and huddle um, away from the windows in the hallway because you do not want to be by the windows when bullets are flying outside of your house, right? So this is where we are living. So what does one do? Um, so the church, like I said, is very devoted to working on um, 
for the good of people in this community. We lived about maybe six blocks away from the church. So the church is very focused on that area. There were other families on our street that were part of the church as well. And so we were trying to get a bit of a critical mass of believers on that street. So one of the things that I discovered um, as I got to know my neighbors, so um, I should bring an update. So the shady characters left to cross the street. There was a, a, a huge SWAT team drug raid and several of them went to prison and the new people came in who were just regular families. So that was a relief. Um, and so I was talking to the mothers. They, we all had kids about the same age. And they said, you know, my daughter is also five years old, but um, she's just not reading. You know, I can't seem to kind of get through to the teachers. It's just not working. I know you're an educator. Can you give us any resources? Is there anything that you can do for us? So after several of these conversations, um, I at the time, so I'm doing my professor, my regular professor work, but I'm also homeschooling my daughter. So I decided to homeschool them for all sorts of reasons. Um, and so I'm sitting there reading the Bible and Shakespeare with my daughters, and across the street, you know, kids are struggling to read. And so I and another African American homeschool mom co-founded Nyansa Classical Community, which is the one that um, that John was telling you about in the introduction. And so for six years in New Orleans, in this same neighborhood with kids from that neighborhood, you know, living just a few blocks away from me, this is what we did. We studied the Bible, we studied classic literature like um, Homer's Odyssey and Iliad, um, we studied black artists um, and black culture, and we really wove together these traditions in a really beautiful way. And so these are some of the scenes from Nyansa Classical Community in New Orleans. And so this is some of the fruit of living with, connecting with, um, being very personal in the lives of the hurting um, folks in this community and really getting to know them and love them. And those um, older um, folks that you see there, relatively older, are my college students. And so I did service learning and my students had the option, they didn't have to, but they had the option of working with me at Nyansa Classical Community, and many of them did. And so these are other scenes from that same program as well. This is them studying Latin. And then this is from their Odyssey project. So we read a children's version of the Odyssey, and then we had them um, learn about the art of African-American artist Romare Bearden. He was an artist in the Harlem Renaissance. He has a whole beautiful series of artworks called The Black Odyssey um, that goes along with kind of the story of the Odyssey. So he's got his own Cyclops and Circe and Odysseus going home, right? But it's all modeled in the idea of the African diaspora and the idea of home. And so he does um, this kind of um, mixture of painting and collage art. And so this is one of the posters of students' collage art in the style of Romare Bearden as we were studying the Odyssey. Um, and so this has been you know, one of the, the central lights of my life um, to kind of do that kind of work in communities that are hurting. So now since I've moved to Virginia, um, that program stopped with COVID because of all of the, the, the restrictions with COVID. And then I moved here in the midst of COVID. So we don't have that program anymore, but happily we have other programs in other parts of the country. So my assistant has just started a Nyansa program in inner city Philadelphia, working with very similar kinds of children. And she has a very similar story. She's a pastor's wife and they live in inner city Philadelphia. You know, so really doing that kind of um, work and living a personalist faith that King is calling us to. And then we had the, the pleasure of having um, an alternative school that works only with foster children um, in Houston use the program last year. And that was also very, very satisfying. Um, and everything that we do, um, it's the kind of program that works with the most privileged kids, because my kids did it for many years. So it works with very privileged kids, and it also works with those who are struggling. And so it's very capacious in order to bring together students from a variety of backgrounds to get a lot out of it, and to hopefully really love them and call them to this vision of what is true, good, and beautiful.
I think often what happens is that we look at folks who are struggling, um, especially young children and their families, and say, well, okay, let's send out the social workers and, you know, kind of like figure out the policies. And of course, we do need social workers and we do need policies. But we also need to call people to something larger and beautiful and to feed the imagination. Without doing that, I fear that all of those efforts fail. You have to have something larger that is beautiful, that is calling you to resist everything that you're seeing around you. Without that larger beauty calling you, it's very difficult, I think, to persevere in those circumstances. So I think I will leave it there, and thank you very much for your attention. Absolutely. Well, I think the first thing um, is to recognize that the black intellectual tradition in particular, many of those, I'd say the majority of those writers had a classical education. And this is something that I think is not very well known. Um, so they, uh, Frederick Douglass, for instance, um, learned how to read using classic texts and classic speeches, rhetorical speeches. Um, Phyllis Wheatley, educated in the classics. Martin Luther King Jr. Everywhere throughout almost everything he writes, you will see reference to classic text. In Letter from a Birmingham Jail, he is citing um, the Apology um, by Socrates. You know, Socrates, um, when he is on his, you know, his last days and he's going to be killed, <laughs> right? I think what is there in the classics is precisely this understanding that I really am someone significant, that my life matters, that this idea of truth, goodness, and beauty is something that attracts me, that I want to give myself more and more to. And also within that whole area, there are many core questions such as what is freedom, right? What is a good society? And so being invited to really think those through, when Douglas was reading the Columbian Order, which is, had all of these classic texts in it, the one um, that really, I mean, many of them stood out, but the one that really stood out to him was um, there were a number of dialogues that were on this question of freedom and freedom from slavery. One was called Dialogue Between a Master and a Slave. And in this dialogue, the person who is the slave is engaging in this rational debate with the person who is the owner and explaining why this thing cannot be, why you can't enslave a human being. It just doesn't work. It puts you on the defensive because you're afraid I'm going to rise up and get you, right? You know, it degrades me and my humanity, and it's just destined to fail. And by the end of the dialogue, the master frees the slave. You know, and so this is some of the beginning of what he's starting to think about, because he's still a young boy. Um, he's starting to kind of think through what is the essence of slavery? You know, what, how are they keeping us enslaved? And it actually, him getting out of slavery started with him learning how to read and with him getting this sense of kind of intellectual and moral freedom. And I think that's part of what the classics do. Is, is to help um, to draw out and to paint a vision of the good life and the good society um, and to help us wrestle with these core questions. What is justice? What is freedom? And so having those texts that help you to really think that through, but then also very beautiful literature. 
you know. Um, and so I think that's what Romeo Bearden is. He's, he was very attracted to this story of the Odyssey and thinking about what is the nature of home and what is the nature of, you know, how do we persevere through so many um, challenges over time. So I think that that is, is part of, of what has attracted so many black intellectuals to the classics is precisely because um, so many of us have been demeaned. You know, so many of us have been seen as not persons, as not worthy of having that kind of intellectual engagement. Um, and so when you see something beautiful, you want to gravitate toward that. Other questions? Yes. So I have a question. Um, I saw that Phyllis Reedley was the uh, face on the poster. Um, so she lived in the 18th century. She was a African American poet, and I quite a, quite enjoyed studying his work, uh, her work as a history student here at Mary. Can you just speak a little bit more about how her work relates to the idea of personalism? Despite, of course, he, uh, her writing way before King and all the other people that we talked about. Absolutely. So yeah, Phyllis Wheatley um, is often understood to be kind of at the foundations of the black intellectual tradition in the United States. She's writing in the 1770s. Um, it's important to know that she she was not born in the U.S. She was born in West Africa, kidnapped, put on a slave ship, and brought over here. So she was very keenly aware of suffering. Right, um, and she was also a woman of very deep faith. So when I think about you know those different principles in this question of kind of concretely what does this faith mean for persons, especially persons who are suffering and who are on the margins, Phyllis Wheatley lived this bodily, remembered what it was like to be thrown into the hold of a slave ship, um, remembered being you know arriving here, being sickly, um, going to the Wheatley house. She was actually named after the ship that brought her here, um, which I just can't even imagine how I would keep that name. So in her letters and her poetry, more in her letters than in her poetry, actually, she addresses this issue of faith and the, dis, um, the disadvantaged and the oppressed. And she says, you know, this faith is such a deep faith. She actually says, I'm not sure how so many white people have failed to understand the essence of the faith. She says, if you all are not going to understand it, she actually uses um, this reference to the crumbs that fall from the rich man's table. That's how she paints it. She says, white people have had this huge head start to really have this mature faith. Um, but if they're not gonna take it, we will take the crumbs from their table and create this faith that really does speak to those who are hurting and suffering because that is the core of what the gospel is. So kind of following up on this, on this kind of central theme of suffering, um, so African Americans have, have kind of been stuck with suffering, and Bonhoeffer is kind of thrust into suffering. Uh, the white evangelical church now still seems to have choices, um, you, know, I think, you know, and I think in some ways the, the move towards uh, Christian nationalism is a, a choice to move away from suffering um, and and I think even other responses are to you know get along with the culture rather than mm -hmm. suffer so mm -hmm. how do you call a church that doesn't necessarily have to suffer mm -hmm. or at least doesn't know it needs to suffer mm -hmm. uh, into this um, personalist um, mm. faith that, that recognizes that is the million dollar question. It, okay, so I'm, I'm gonna say a couple of things. I don't know how well received they will be. Um, as I have gone to different places across the country, giving talks, um, I do a lot of talks in the classical education world. Um, 
And many, that tends to draw a largely white conservative evangelical crowd, right? Not only, but it tends to draw quite a few. Um, so if they're inviting me, it's because they do want to hear this, so that's good. But I have noticed a pattern that quite often um, those who are white in my audience who come up to me who really connect with this, they have skin in the game in the sense that they have maybe adopted black children or they are married to someone black. And I find this over and over again that that is who seems to be most passionate about hearing what I have to say. Now, I don't want to think that one has to have black children or a black spouse in order to get to what you're talking about. I, I would hope not. But it seems to me like those are the folks who are the most passionate and the most convinced that what I'm saying has merit. I think that others also find it interesting and compelling in some way, but there's a difference between, again, a kind of intellectual understanding that this is something good and could be good for me versus a everything is at stake in this thing and we have to get this right. And I don't know how you get that without having real relationships with people on the margins. It doesn't have to only be black people. There are other people. There are white people on the margins. Look at the opioid epidemic. There's a whole group of white people who feel very oppressed and feel that they are not heard, they're not seen, they're not respected. So it's not only about race, right? I can't figure out how to get to what you're talking about without those relationships. And that's why I ended talking about moving into Central City and saying that I had three degrees in sociology. I've always tried to, you know, to do the right thing, and, and, but it really wasn't until I was right there and I had something at stake that it really clicked. Um, and that's why on that one slide when King says, you know, you really have to be in relationship. Like this thing doesn't just happen. Uh, in fact, in moving to Charlottesville, which is probably the opposite of Central City, you know, when we first showed up there, I and my kids looked around and were like, oh my gosh, everybody's rich, you know, wow. Like we were just like, we have just like come to the promised land, you know, like everything is beautiful, there's no trash on the streets, you know, like we're living on the equivalent of Cherry Tree Lane, like literally. Um, and I thought, you know, this is going to make it a lot harder now. This is going to make it a lot harder because we're not seeing the junkies when we go out. We're not seeing the prostitutes who are addicted. We're not seeing the kids who are struggling at home. So, um, you know, and it's for this reason I, I was telling John this, that I am uh, kind of desperate to get one of these programs going close to where I live. Because there are people, even in Charlottesville, who are on the margins. Um, but there have been a number of issues with doing that, partly. Um, the, the, it's a relatively small community, and you have a huge research university and education school that saturated the community with programs. You know, So I don't know if I will ever have one in Charlottesville, maybe somewhere else in Virginia that I can drive to. Um, but I do think it's really important to have those relationships. And without those real, and I'm not talking about a, like a drop in for a missions trip or, you know, like that's, that doesn't, it really doesn't do it. There has to be something on the line for you with people that you love. Now, that might leave us in a fairly dismal spot because I also don't see a lot of those folks rushing over to find those people. Again, not necessarily black people you know, go to where there are really hurting um, white people, but don't recruit them for your Christian nationalist project, right? Um, go to them with something else that is truly life-giving, because now I fear it becomes a, well, let's go and they are hurting, but maybe we can recruit them for this kind of project, which is a project that I think is devastating. 
churches. And um, I just was wondering, isn't that where we're all made in the image of God? And uh, he likes all the colors of flowers and people. Um, I think maybe, I wonder if that's where it should start, what, what the scripture says about that we are made in the image of God. And, uh, and that is a foundation, maybe, that would be a better help Mm. Yeah, so that quote was taken from Bonhoeffer, um, one of his letters home, where he is reporting um, to folks back in Germany on what he's finding in the United States. And that was particular to mainstream liberal white churches. So, so it, was a, it was a fairly specific comment that he was making there. Um, I wouldn't want to say that applies to every white church today. Like that, that was a very specific cultural historical context. However, um, I do think that um, relying on the scriptures is very important, but we also know that we, as fallen humans, tend to recruit the scriptures for our individual projects. And so it's not necessarily a panacea to say, well, let's go to the scriptures, because we tend to read the scriptures with our own ends in mind and shape them to say what we want them to say. Um, so I, I think that's part of it, but I also think it helps when you're able to read the scriptures and be in conversation with people coming from different experiences and backgrounds so that some of that maybe is corrected. Um, otherwise, again, you know, this goes back to the previous question, kind of if you're in one particular bubble where everyone's going to read it the same way in a, in a self-serving way, then you know the, the, the life in the scriptures is not going to do what it could do otherwise. And I think it often does take us coming together across some differences to be able to wrestle with what is actually going on in scripture and how to live it out. Fatalistic. Fatalistic. Mm -hmm. um, and so he realized that he wrote a book called um, the, the Book That Changed Your World. And he, he really lays out the, you know, this kind of idea of the image of God um, mm. and the value of the individual. And these different things that realized that, that contrary to what happened in India, where people gave, kind of gave up and it's just fatalistic, the Bible gave That's great. That's great. Yeah. I mean, I do, I do agree that the, the scripture, when it's really taken in a life-giving way, um, is obviously transformative. I think what's hard is when you are in a very privileged place. And I put myself there, too, right? You know, I'm not hurting. <laughs> you know, when you're in a very privileged place, it's so easy to just rest and get comfortable. And that was my big concern in moving to Charlottesville. It's like, we're going to be so comfortable here. Um, and so then you have to work all the harder, you know, to kind of like, oh, wait, like, let's remember, like, what, why are we really doing, what is the point? The point is not to get more and more accolades and more and more stuff. Like, that's not the point of my life. Right? Um, and it's just harder when you're in the center of luxury and privilege. Um, and so I think moving to that kind of community is really important. So other examples um, would be the CCDA model, the Christian Community Development Association model. 
um, with John Perkins and, and others who've been very, very active. And so the whole model for what we did in New Orleans was a CCDA model. The idea of moving into the neighborhood, the idea that Christ moved into the neighborhood to be among us. So I'd say, you know, many of those CCDA communities are doing exactly what this gentleman did in India, right? So he's moving into this small village, um, and the CCDA communities across the country are doing a very similar kind of thing. You know, relocate, reconcile, redistribute. Um, and I think the redistribute trips us up as Americans, right? Because then it's like, oh, wait, are we becoming communists? No. Um, but if we look at you know the Acts 2 church, like there there is a radical generosity there. You know, it doesn't have to be a coerced generosity, um, but there is a radical generosity. Um, so I think that is one that I look to as a model, the CCDA model. I think is a very good one. So let me make sure I'm understanding. So that last point, I can't lose my salvation because of someone else. How would that happen? Or what, what would people say about how that would happen? Well, the, the, the fear that drives that, um, that tends to be away from the sin of the world and therefore... Oh, because you might be contaminated. Exactly. Yeah. All right. How to yeah. reform community kind of across the church to them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Um, and, and this is where I say, you know, some people will say that the Benedict Option has been misread and, and that, that Dreyer is not calling for a withdrawal. Um, others do see him calling for that withdrawal. Um, I have to say, when I first read it, it seemed to me like it was calling for a withdrawal. Um, and I did actually speak to Dreyer. He came to, to speak shortly after it was published. And I said, you know, um, I'm very familiar with the Benedictine tradition. I'm a Benedictine oblate, which means that you are an associate of a Benedictine community, right? So I've spent a lot of time in Benedictine monasteries and retreats and praying and eating with Benedictine nuns and so on. And I just wasn't recognizing them in the pages of the Benedict option. I was like, it's just, I don't know, I've been with a lot of Benedictines and none of them are saying anything like this. Um, you know, like their big thing is hospitality, inviting people in. Um, the reason I can even be a Benedictine oblate, because I'm not Catholic, is the explanation that the um, oblate director gave me is that, well, we, you know, Benedict existed before the split in the church. So we welcome all Christians. You know, so I had always had this very radical, open, hospitable, generous, you know, yes, they are in a monastery, so they are literally away, but just so oriented toward reaching out and loving and welcoming in. And I just wasn't getting it in the Benedict option. Um, and so I asked him about this, and his response was, well, I wanted to make it accessible to non-Catholics. To which I said, well, I am a non-Catholic. Benedictine oblate. Um, you know, like, that is a thing. It is possible. Like, you could have written a very different book about the Benedict Option that's really built on what I see as the core of Benedictine spirituality. And again, you know, I don't have the whole vision, but again, I've spent a lot of years in monasteries eating, you know, praying with Benedictine nuns. And it, it, they, they paint a very different vision than what I saw in the Benedict Option. Um, but, all that to say, I do think it is very important for believers to very carefully cultivate um, Christian community. I do think it's very important. Um, Dreyer does talk about um, 
you know, how are we educating our children, right? Are we sure that we do want to send them to the local public school? Now, I'm not going to throw public schools under the bus. You know, they're doing a very important public service, but I do think it's realistic to ask the question and to think about it, right? Obviously, I decided not to go that way. So I homeschooled for 13 years, and then now my daughters are at a classical Christian school. Um, but on the other side of it, with um, what um, James K. Smith is saying with his kind of Augustinian option, he is also saying that we have to very carefully cultivate Christian community, that we can't just kind of seamlessly seep into the culture and be assimilated to it. So kind of whichever of those versions you take, you're going to have to be very intentional about cultivating Christian community. But that can be done with very different spirit, right? It can be done with a spirit of, you know, raise up the barriers and, you know, call to arms and, like, keep them all out. Or it can be done with a, you know, a spirit of we are going to, um, you know, train our children well. We're going to have regular prayer in our home and we're going to, you know, be very intimately connected in Christian community. But we're also going to reach beyond ourselves and love people and model that love rather than seeing those are the enemy out there, right? So I, I think, you know, on the surface it might look similar, but I think it can be motivated by different spirits in terms of how we're related to and thinking about those outside of the bounds of the church. Well, thank you so much, Jen. Otherwise, we hope to see you um, on April 12th at our next lecture. And again, let's thank Dr. Farmer. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure.